Please welcome Chief Executive Officer of the Grand Rapids Children's Museum, Maggie Lancaster. Chief Executive Officer of Michigan Humane, Matt Pepper. Director of Mobility and Volunteerism at Ford Motor Company Fund, Joe Provenzano. And to moderate the discussion, please welcome Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Delta Dental, Margaret Trimmer. Good morning. These chairs are way too big. I feel like I'm lost in here. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. Um, quality, not quantity, perhaps, in the room. All those people, what did they do last night? Yeah. Um, this is a really, really important topic, obviously, in our world today, um, but really important topic for those of us who care about equity in our communities and multiple solutions for delivering on that promise. Um, we're going to start this morning with a quick video, and I apologize, it's a little bit of a commercial. It's a project that Delta Dental is involved in, um, but it really was a catalyst for understanding the power of reaching people where they are. Um, this project is called Motor City Cares, and it's about bringing a greater uh, level of public health to the part of Detroit that is considered, a part of Detroit that is considered a dental desert. Um, so we're bringing greater public health. We're also helping black dental professionals build wealth. These are two small businesses that we gifted to two black dental entrepreneurs. And if you can take it away and take a two minute break to watch I'm this Dr. video. I'm Dr. Quan Watson, a dentist and entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Care Mobile, based out of Louisville, Kentucky. Care Mobile and Delta Dental, along with Ford Motor Company Fund and Lightship Foundation, has launched the Motor City Cares Giveaway. It will offer a minority dentist licensed in Michigan the chance to win a Ford Transit Mobile Dental Office. This vehicle will serve children and families in low-income communities. Care Mobile provides comprehensive concierge mobile dental services wherever you need them. We provide licensing opportunities for dentists and hygienists to own and operate their own mobile dental practices. We had two goals in mind, to improve oral health equity in Corktown and Mexican Town, and to contribute to community wealth by helping a minority dentist or hygienist launch a new practice in an area that really needs greater access to oral health care. Yeah. 63 million people across the country live in a dental desert. There are very few providers offering service in low-income communities. So this was one way we thought we could help uh, bridge that divide. and help people. After a year on the streets, we're finally in a groove. Um, you can give a tool to a professional dentist, doctor, lawyer, whatever, but teaching them to be an entrepreneur is a whole different ballgame. So we help build capacity, and I'm really proud to say that we've served almost 1,000 low-income patients in southwest Detroit and Corktown, and they're actually now at a point where they're building a commercial business as well with these one-person dental vans. So it's really exciting on a couple of different fronts. The demand is overwhelming. We just need more. Yeah. Mobility, mobile solutions. It's really not a new concept, right? If you think back over the years, and I can go way back, there were bookmobiles. They actually used to bring mobile swimming pools to neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods where kids don't get a chance to swim very much. Um, so mobile is not the new thing here, right? Um, but innovation around mobility is. And it's really not your mother or your father or your grandparents' mobile solutions. Um, we have big missions, we have big innovations, we have big challenges that we're bringing to the table in today's mobility arena. Maggie, we're gonna start with you because you have a big mission with a lot of little people and mobile has made a huge difference. Can you talk about what you're doing with the Kids Can Van in Grand Rapids? Yeah, thank you so much, and, and thanks for having us here, Margaret. Um, what a pleasure to speak on behalf of uh, children's museums across the world. Uh, we were founded by four amazingly brilliant, strong women um, well over 30 years uh, ago, and uh, what did they know? And in fact, uh, people often would pat them on the head and say, oh, this is a really nice little thing that you're doing. Fast forward four million people later uh, who have come through our doors 
uh, we are just so proud to provide that opportunity for open-ended play for the critical importance of brain development, essentially, uh, for children. But when Margaret walked into my office um, in 2018, uh, she kind of just started on the job. I had kind of just started on the job. And what I was sharing was we're bursting at the seams. How can we get out into the community and bring play to them? At the time, we were about $9. Um, that's without our education and veterans um, um, discounts. $9. And in, in let's say just a family of six. What, do you, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose you know, that um, admission or are you going to choose food? And how are you going to get there? And the parking. And you know, the barriers were very, very significant. And fortunately for me, Delta Dental, Margaret got that. And they said, how about we provide you a Ford Transit and you can go to them. And uh, we, this was outstanding. We cheered, Margaret left, we all did high fives. We um, did non-alcoholic champagne, bur you know, pops <laughs> and, um, and just celebrated. Little did we know though what was coming and how we needed that transit van. And we closed for 15 months during COVID, like many of you. And how were you going to reopen with a hands-on children's museum? You know, these kids have stuff coming out of their nose and crevices like no other, <laughs> you know. But hey, come on in. We're safe, you know. Uh, so we, we essentially formed an assembly line during our shutdown. And uh, we created uh, Play at Home Kids that went out. Uh, we partnered with food distribution centers and provided that open-ended play to them. I bet you have a million stories. Yeah. Yeah, prob I mean, when you're there and you're, you know, first of all, they're driving through. You can't even really talk or touch or see the family. <laughs> but once they saw whether it was the um, Silly Putty or the Play-Doh, or the soccer balls, that, that was it. The kids were opening the windows. It was like COVID didn't even exist. You know, They were like, oh my gosh, this is so, so exciting. The car, I felt so bad because when the cars pulled away, you know, you'd see like just random things flying in the back seat because they were so excited uh, to have that opportunity uh, to play. I think they just thought we were just pulling up to grab our food and our essentials, but I would argue we gave them essentials as well. Maggie, how did you name the van? There was some engagement with the community there as well. Yes, we, we opened it up to the community. I did not come up with that name, and I wish I could show you the list of names uh, that came out. And uh, we, we went with Kids Can Van because of the amazing youngster, um, and actually in Hudsonville, Michigan, who named the Kids Can Van. I thought we'd have the smile mobile or something, but kids can van is way better, way better. Um, Ford is a common thread that runs through all of these projects and that really runs through the conversation about mobility in general. Um, but it's not the transit vehicle that is so important to this work. Um, and that's not to discount the importance of transits. I love transits. Um, but there, Joe, there's more to this conversation than the delivery system. There's innovation, there's mission, there's entrepreneurship, there's a whole lot more. Why is Ford so invested in these projects and also just this conversation about how to serve in a different way? Yeah, um, great question. And uh, first, thanks so much for sponsoring this. And it's a pleasure being on the stage here with Matt and Maggie. Um, when we think about Ford Motor Company as it, the work that we've done for the last 120 years, we're a mobility company. So it logically makes sense, how can we help solve access to transportation? Um, and really try to build on the mission that we have as a company, and that's, that's freedom of movement. Uh, and when you look at the facts and you think about, you know, nearly six million people every year miss medical appointments or delay medical appointments because they don't have access to reliable, affordable, and safe transportation. Um, there's, there's just this immediate need in all of the work that we're doing in community to try to bring that to life. So when you talk about the physical vehicle, that's one piece. 
But I think when you start talking about the relationships, the ability to bring expertise together, um, you know, I'm proud to be at the Ford Motor Company Fund in the ability to convene and bring people together to solve issues. And um, I think that's sort of what you're getting at when you, when you ask that question, Margaret. It's not just the vehicle or the service, it's building relationships, it's understanding community. Um, and we're a global philanthropy. And so, you know, we, we have our resource and engagement centers in Detroit where we've built really, really strong relationships with the communities. Um, we have them globally. But it's, it's, it's having those deep, intentional conversations on what are the needs that can be addressed. And, you know, the way that we think about it is mobility is an amplifier. You could have a lot of different initiatives, programs, um, but when you add that layer of mobility solution and access, and we talk about it today, it's a perfect theme in equity, you then are just amplifying the, the outcomes and the impact in community. So it's, it's core to who we are, and you know, we couldn't be more excited to be part of this conversation because I think um, the advocacy piece is, is really important as well. I love that mobility is an amplifier. Um, what you partnered with us on the Motor City Cares Project. And when I first reached out to the team at Ford Motor Company Fund, they said to me, you know what, we're doing mobile dental in Brazil. I'm sure we can figure out how to do it in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about what else you're doing around the world in this arena? Yeah, I think, <coughs> excuse me, um, when we think about mobility, I, maybe, maybe just to step back and talk a little bit about the fund and then I'll hone in on the mobility piece. Um, but as I said, we're a global philanthropy in over 40 countries. Um, and we really are trying to focus on how do we deliver uh, essential services is one key area of work. And then also um, education in the future of work. So are we creating pathways for education in job training? And then the last piece, which we touched on a little bit with Dr. Watson and the initiative that we did with you, Margaret, was entrepreneurship. And so when you look across those three different core areas um, at the fund, we're focused on that work in all the communities that we're in. Um, and then when you talk about globally, we have global initiatives, mobility challenges, and it really comes back down to what I said at the top, it's partnerships. Um, you can go to any, any community and those needs are gonna be different. You can talk to any one person and that lived experience is different. Um, and I think as we've done this work more and we get more involved and, and we build these relationships, it becomes to understanding these barriers. And I know this group here has had, um, prior to this, this conversation today, there are so many um, barriers to access. So we could have the greatest mobility solution, but if we haven't built that trust and relationship with community to understand what are the needs that need to be addressed, I think, I think that's, that's the key and that's the critical piece. And so uh, we're fortunate to be able to do that around the globe. Matt, animals and essential services. Mm -hmm. They go together. People don't always realize that. Yep. Talk to us about how your work and mobile solutions go together. Thank you, Margaret and Maggie and Joe. It's an honor to share the, the stage here. And I, when you look at the, the title here, Increasing Equity and, uh, and Quality of Life Through Mobile Solutions, it's easy for someone to go, why is, a, why is an animal welfare person up here? And I'll, I'm going to start by telling you a quick story that, that's not really related to mobility, but it's, but it's important because when we talk about mobility, we think of it as essential services, food, shelter, things. What I want to lay the foundation of is that pets are not optional. They are essential to many people. So I was a first responder to Hurricane Katrina. I was there right in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And I was stationed in Tylertown, Mississippi, and there was a gentleman uh, walking uh, up the road, bare feet, and every step he took, he would leave a footprint of blood in the, in the ground to get to us, carrying a small little white dog. And his story was, as the, as the levees collapsed and the National Guard came through and said, it's time to go, the water's coming now. I mean, the water was rising then. He said, all right, let me go get my dog. And they said, no, nope, no dogs. At that point, emergency plans did not include plans for pets. No dogs, you gotta go. <clears throat> he said, fine, I'll be right back. And he didn't come back. He took his dog and he hid in the attic. because He wasn't going to leave his dog. And come to find out, the water rose and rose and rose and he stood on a hot tin roof in New Orleans for three days holding his dog. And all he wanted when he approached us was food for his dog. He didn't want any money for food for himself. He just wanted food for his dog. And why I say that is we think of essential services as, as food, shelter, 
transportation, but we don't often think of them as pets. The reality is pets are a critical part of people's lives. And if I asked everyone in this room who's got a picture of their pet on their phone, <laughs> just like the rest of America, 70% of you would say yes. And if I asked you to show them, I'd lose you for the rest of the time. <laughs> we'll but do that afterwards. Everybody do that afterwards, ready. and I expect to see all of them. But the reality is through all social, economic, every way you can divide people, 70% of people have pets and they will prioritize the needs of their pets over their own. In our mobility, I consider it as, you talked about mission innovation, I think it's opportunity through collaboration because what we have found is that we have a really unique access into people's lives. And we got that through failure. I think it's important to talk about our failure. What mobility looked like 20 years ago in animal welfare was we would swoop in from the suburbs, bring in a bunch of shots and say, here's where we're gonna offer, what we're gonna offer, come and get it. And if you didn't do it, we vilified you for not liking your pet. That wasn't, that wasn't how we got anywhere. Now it's about getting into the community and really finding out the passion that exists and using the community as our biggest asset rather than a service we're trying to address. So ours, ours looks like uh, mobile veterinary clinics into people who are most vulnerable and can't access care. But what's most important about that is what happens afterwards. Is that we talk to someone about their pet and we say, oh, you can't, you can't feed your pet. Here's, here's 30 pounds of the 1.7 million pounds of pet food we distributed last year. And then one of our human social workers will come in. And you may not think of Michigan Humane as having human social workers. We have interns from Michigan, interns from Wayne State, MSWs on staff. And we do that because once we're busy, once we're done addressing the animal issue, the question is going to be, what else, what other issues are in this family unit? And you talked about the opportunity that, that exists from, from mobility. That's where it is. It's using pets as a window into people's lives and recognizing that, uh, real quick, you know, we, so many people today have called the Michigan Humane Society. The Re reality is we changed our name to Michigan Humane a few years ago. Why that's relevant to mobility is the word humanity does not limit itself to pets or people, and it, it extends to both ends of the leash. So it allows us to come in, help the pet, and then go, what else is happening while we're there in their home? So what are the kinds of things that you see in their home that you wouldn't see or notice if they were bringing their pets exclusively to the Mackey Center? The, the, so frankly, when we talk about uh, food insecurity, for example, um, we work very closely with gleaners. In fact, we are, we are co-housed uh, with them in their, in their new, new factory because of the recognition that if we are not present, people will feed their human food to their pets. So your intended purpose isn't being met. Um, we find uh, uh, a lot of issues. So I'll give you a great story. I was, I was touring the dean of Wayne State's social work program, Dean Kubiak, and a, a woman came through one of our mobile pantries and she stopped and she looked at me and, and she, I said, can I pet your dogs? These are amazing dogs, amazing dogs. And I pet them and loved them and she looked at me and said, thank you. She said, because these were my sister's dogs. My, my sister passed away and my kid loves these dogs. And I, 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 I love, you know, I had, a, I had my job, I lost that. So I'm having trouble taking care of the dogs. And, because you're here, normally I'd rely on my parents, but a couple years ago they passed away, they've had a hard time. And she stood there and looked at me and said, you got from asking, can I pet your dogs, what a social worker takes years to get out of. That she's probably struggling with, uh, well, she's struggling with grief, she's she has children who probably need some assistance, she's struggling with access to, to, to other services, she probably has issues with utilities if she's struggling with her job. All of those things just by asking, can I pet your pet? And that's where our relationships um, are, are, are so beneficial because there are two ends of every leash and, and a pet is only as healthy and safe as the family it lives with and that's a great opportunity. Pets offer us a really unique opportunity and when we're in the community, not only do we bring services to people who typically can't, can't get to them, but we offer opportunity for people in the community to see this as a career opportunity to serve this community. I just wish you brought some passion to your work. <laughs> um. <laughs> These seats, by the way, are big enough for people to share a dog. Um, it would be perfect so, to have a little cat right here. I know, a little a couple dog cats right on here. stage would be great. You know, I'm a great thing kind of person. I need a big dog, but um, but it, it could fit. Um, you're using your Ford Transit specifically for veterinary, and the food pantry is not um, done in the same way that your mobile vet is. Well, operating. thanks to our, our Ford Lightning that we have. Uh, that we also deliver uh, food to multiple locations. What we have learned is that we don't want to do, the mobility is, is best when it's in collaboration, not in, not in isolation. So one of the reasons, I'll use our example of why we partner so much with, with Gleaners and Forgotten Harvest who provide so much of our food, is that we know how to source dog food. They know how to get it to people. 
So let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's create partnerships that get us into places in the community where it's more accessible. Because we know through 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 success, and you could you could you could articulate it as a an opportunity is that our, our former pet food pantry, which was really successful, was great for the people who lived right there. Now that we've distributed, we've, we've, we've been piggybacking off others' models of distribution. We've already, this last month alone, we did 140,000 pounds to 90,000 pounds the year before. So we're already significantly impacting the amount of, of resources we're able to distribute. But it's anything. It's uh, our, our social workers, it's our food, it's connecting people to veterinary appointments, it's, uh, it's uh, everything. So right. partnerships, really key. I think you and Maggie were talking earlier this week, pets and play, they really need to go together, right? I, I was just so impressed to hear um, you know, Matt speak about even the relationship with the Michigan Science Center. You know, like, what? Why, why would he be partnering with the Michigan Science Center? You know, any type of partnership that can bring possibly his opportunity to expose um, pets that need to be adopted and Michigan Science Center is a beautiful space with a lot of people coming through. Why not partner there? But the other thing that we, we talked about, um, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this too, was the critical importance of play in an animal's life as well. You know, I mean, I always say to people who are like, oh, my dog chewed up, you know, my third shoe uh, this week. And I just want to say, have them go play. They need more play in their lives. It's real, it's not, it's not frivolous, it is real. That brain development in all living things is absolutely critical in that social emotional learning, the executive functioning, the physical, the mental, I can't even get started on the mental health aspect of it. But it, it's important, pets and play. So when my son chewed my shoe, I should have just sent him out to play. That's a different story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so pets and play, I mean, that's a partnership potential. Can you talk, both, all of you, talk about the power of partnerships in these mobile solutions? Is it greater possibility to collaborate when you're on the road in serving in these ways? Well, I, I just one thing that I would add to uh, that is so important, and I think you guys have hit on why, right? There's all of these synergies that can amplify the work that we're trying to try to achieve and the outcomes that we want to see for people in their lives. Um, the other, the flip side of it is, is that shared expertise, like leaning into where the expertise is and not recreating the wheel. Uh, when you think of philanthropic dollars, they're limited, right? So we have to be very intentional and, and good stewards of that money and that funding. And so uh, when we talk about mobility, mobility is expensive. If we talk about building a fleet of vehicles, it's drivers, it's insurance, it's oil changes, it's all of these things. So how do we think about leveraging these partnerships to drive down cost so those dollars that we do have can go to really changing people's lives? And so I think that's a, that's a big piece of the partnership. And then you guys have just explained in this conversation um, and Matt, in, in your partnership uh, with Gleaners and how you can combine those together and then have a greater outcome in community. So I, I think that speaks to the efficiency and sort of the thoughtfulness and the intentionalness that I know we've shared in our discussions about mobility, but it really is that piece that's that amplification piece in community that we can achieve. And, and I, it, it, speaking of the partnerships piece of it, you know, just this month alone, I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna miss a lot of them, but you know, this weekend um, in Grand Rapids is the big art festival. We, we will be there. Um, it, it's the Asian Pacific Festival next weekend. We will be there. It is the Pride Festival in three weeks. We will be there. And, and I know it's like, oh yeah, that's so nice. You get to partner with all these people when all the streets are closed down. And, and speak on your mission, but it's more than that. We have a program, for example, it's called Museums for All. It's a national program that museums can all participate in. And if you participate in it, you can, and if you have a, any type of EVT card, SNAP, WIC, any of that, you can get in the Children's Museum for $1.75 up to 12 family members. How am I supposed to get that word out if I'm not going to them? Because we, they already can't afford to get into us, so go to them, share this information, and of course, in every language we can possibly translate it, and share with them, you too can come play. That's a lot of what 
I feel the Kids Can Van has done for us. So paint a picture though. You don't just drive into a neighborhood and say, hey, we're here and knock on doors. That's not how it looks. No. Well, what does it look like? A perfect, out? yeah, another, like I think it's next weekend, it's Rock the Block. And what they have done is that neighborhood association has brought all of us together and said, this is your area, you park your van here, and then we bring all, whether it's exhibits, it's Imagination Playground, which is a bunch of amazing foam blocks, it's water play, it's slime, it's dirt, it's everything that are all of us adults' worst nightmare that goes on inside your house. Um, we love that, the dirtier the better. Um, but it wouldn't, if it wasn't for the neighborhood associations, for example, inviting us in, that wouldn't happen. Is fear of neighborhoods, danger, crime, a factor when you put your show on the road and you go into communities that maybe your staff are not a part of or haven't been to before or people look different from them? Matt? Well, I would, <clears throat> I would answer that if it is fear, it's fear of the unknown. And the reality was our, you know, I think, we, we did a good job in the past of being in a community and not part of a community. So when you said it's not going door to door, knocking on doors, yeah, it is for us. <laughs> it is for us. Uh, we started in the North End. We've done Warrendale. We've done, we're, doing, we're in Southwest Detroit now. <clears throat> and the reality is that's, it's amazing how you know, communities that I think we have this fear of or have been promised a lot of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when we open the door and say, I'm just here to talk about your pet, the world opens up. <clears throat> and it a lot. Thank you. I've got a water right here. Excuse me, just one second. Feeling yours. All the flowers. It's a lack of dog hair. Yeah. <laughs> dog hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it is that for us. It is going door to door and then finding out who the people are we're serving. And I will tell you, we held a, we went into the North End a little while ago and held a community meeting talking about a dog park. And what was fantastic was, and I think he was sort of joking at the time, the representatives from the city came out saying, well, I went in wondering if I'd need to build a dog park. Now I know I need to build three. Yeah. Because safe spaces for people to engage with their pets differently does a lot of things. It creates interconnected communities which are healthier, which are safer. And uh, again, it goes back to pets not only, not only essential to our own lives, but they're essential to a community's success. Joe, you see a lot of different verticals beyond what we're talking about here. You're working with, I think, Dr. Levy at Wayne State doing some work, blood pressure and other health care. Yes. What are you seeing in terms of what it looks like and feels like to take mobile services out? Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of partnerships that we have. Uh, Dr. Levy's been a great partner in Wayne Health uh, since COVID and the COVID testing that they did with their mobile units. Um, I think it's a learning process, right? Uh, it's, it's developing uh, shared expertise in, in how to gauge an engaged community. And I think in the particular example with Wayne Health, it's, it's been progressive over time. Initially, it was COVID testing, then it was you know, preventative um, care for, for heart disease. And uh, we partnered with them last year on an investment for access to uh, medication. And um, so thinking about how we can take that to the next level, I think the, the one thing that becomes important, and I see it in a lot of the different verticals that we work in, is it's place-based and it also is mobility. Like you have to have a place to bring people together. Um, and you know, I've seen that in almost every partnership discussion that we've had. Um, I know that we at our community uh, resource and engagement centers in Detroit, you know, that is a place where people gather and it's a collective um, where you can build trust. And so I think that becomes um, a really important part of how do we think about that and how do we build it. And I, I think it's also an exciting time in mobility. Um, the pandemic did something where it sort of accelerated the use of delivery services because we were forced into it. And now we have the ability to look at mobility and say, how has it changed things? How has it changed the administration of healthcare? How has it changed access? How has it changed you know, how we engage and build relationships and community? And I think the state of Michigan has, has been on the forefront of that uh, you know, through, the, through the Office of Future Mobility and, and Electrification and, and Tim Slusser in the city of Detroit have been doing great work. And then you have the backdrop of, of Michigan Central and Bill's vision on this ecosystem, and I know Josh is gonna speak later today, but you take all of those pieces and start putting those together, 
and I think there's just so much opportunity. Um, but to your question, I think it's continuous learning and how can we sort of have really, really deep change through building relationships. Can I comment real quick on something, Joe? You just, you talked about, um, you know, the, the, the pandemic a little bit. And I thought, you know, there's, there's many organizations going, how do I get back to normal? The reality is I think we found a better normal through the pandemic Me and, and meeting people, you know, where they were. We found a, you know, we talked about mobility not being cheap. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot cheaper than building a $30 million animal shelter. And it also is a lot more uh, accessible to people with a lot broader reach. And it, be it becomes less transactional and more relationship-based. And we have found significantly more champions in the community through being in people's homes. So I just think you know, that the pandemic, we've looked at it as, okay, what are things that we need to kind of go back to? And what are things that just were, frankly, better ways of doing business? And I think through, that mo through getting into the community more, I don't think we've ever been more relevant to the community in general as we are now. Yeah. So let, I, I'm going to take a moment to let you know you have cards on the table. If you have questions, please write them down, and chamber folks will gather them and give them to me. Um, and we'll save time for those at the end. Um, but cost, you, you can absolutely see what you just said, Matt, that there is an efficiency to putting mobile as opposed to building bricks and mortar. Um, we have a continuum of mobile delivery for dental. We have three-chair mobile RVs, which cost about a million and a half dollars. And we put those on the road. We gifted one to UD Mercy. We've gifted them all over the state. Those are one way of serving. A million and a half is a lot of money, and you have to have a driver for those. We put these two mobile units on the streets, and they are very nimble. They can literally go door to door. And Medicaid, for those of you who don't know, a lot of providers do not want to participate with Medicaid because there's a huge amount of no-shows in the community. When life happens, low-income folks are stuck. Very often, transportation is an enormous barrier. Um, and so we are really glad the state has increased reimbursements in Medicaid. They used to pay $9 for a dentist to do an exam. Now the state pays $29. So things are going in the right direction. Um, but, but I say that because there is a continuum of delivery. And some mobile are more expensive than others. But there's not just possibilities in serving low income and underserved people. There's possibilities for people to make real money and build real businesses. Joe, you're probably seeing more of that potential in the work that you do. Can yeah. you talk about how there's another side? It's not just let's serve low income, let's make some money and build some businesses. What does that look like? Yeah, I, I mean, that's exactly right, Margaret. So in the work that we're doing in mobility, there's sort of two, two types or two areas that we sort of focus on. One is what we sort of talked about is how do we put social impact and essential services and bringing services to people on wheels? And the flip side to what you just referred to is the entrepreneurship piece. So I think um, the work with Dr. Watson and Care Mobile and our partnership with you and the Lighthouse Foundation is a really good example of, you know, how are we taking innovation through an entrepreneur, finding a need that needs to be solved in community, which is access to dental care, and then also building uh, into that process and that model the ability to have businesses. And so we have, in that particular case, um, my community dental center, and we also have a dental hygienist who are operating those vans in building businesses in, in extending their businesses in addition to serving the community. So, um, you know, that's, that's a critical piece, and I think that's something as we, we start talking about these collaborations and the shared expertise, it becomes more impactful, but the entrepreneurship piece and the opportunity to create generational wealth in partnering with community and in uh, having that happen in community is, is really impactful. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's, there's plenty of examples uh, that we've seen, but the one with Dr. Watson is one that really hits on all of those different um, characteristics. And it was shared expertise between, you know, the work that you do and the, the work we do at the Ford Fund. So I think that's a great example. Real quick, I, I think that's a, a great point. And as a nonprofit, sometimes there's a, there's a you know, we, sometimes we, we criticize them for, for being nonprofits, not acting like businesses. The reality is there's a really unique opportunity for us in our mobility work to add a, a layer of sustainability to it. 
So <clears throat> I could spend you know, Monday serving folks who cannot pay, cannot get access to it. Then I can go out Tuesday to serve people who'd rather pay a couple hundred bucks more to not go to the vet and have someone come to their home. And that offsets the costs for our work. So mobility offers us the opportunity to be more nimble, reactive, but also provide some um, offsetting cost opportun offsetting opportunities. Right. Maggie, yeah. it, I, I feel like also that for us, it is, it's so true of how we feel about ourselves, I think, as nonprofits, but we are a business and we are exposing for the first time children to potential um, jobs moving forward. You know, I always feel like it, we are creating, when, when kids can't necessarily figure out how to add that wheel in the Lego at our Lego table, and they ponder it and ponder it, try to work through it and tinker and talk maybe with others, or our play facilitators may step in, or how to create the perfect bubble and how to keep it up in the air by <laughs> blowing it up in there. And, and th those, again, might seem silly, but we are creating our future creative entrepreneurs. It's them tinkering and learning how to problem solve. And, and it might also be the exposure maybe of the next vet tech that you, mm -hmm. you need, you know? And, and certainly people in, at the Ford Motor Company, but if we don't get to them and expose them, uh, it's not gonna happen very quickly. Speaking of Lego, notice Maggie's earrings are <laughs> Lego blocks. Um, I, I really hang out with her because I learned that play is okay for adults too. It really is, and it, it's even more important these days, yes. Unfortunately, maybe our play sometimes involves uh, red wine, but that's okay. But never here at Mackinac. No, so, uh, no, can, no. Can I add? Can I add to that though? Um, not the red wine piece, but um, <laughs> oh, you can. When, you like white, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> um, but when you guys are talking and, and just speaking about how that comes together and thinking about um, you know the way that we can try to amplify and, and, and think about bringing that and bringing more people along. It's, it's sort of the education piece that you touched on, Maggie. And it's also building, uh, when we think of all of the great things that are happening in the city right now with mobility, it's also giving um, the youth of Detroit the ability to see themselves in the future. So with the backdrop of Michigan Central, the work that Tim and his, his, his office are doing, um, you know, we want uh, to be able to, to leverage mobility and innovation for people, for, for career training, just like you said, Maggie, so they can see themselves in a city where they can prosper and have job opportunities. And so I think that's a big piece of it too. So as we start building out mobility, the future of work and those education pathways and that career training is a critical part. I know it's, it's uh, key to the policy at Michigan Central and the, and the work that's happening right now, but I just think that's a really important piece because we can build that out and allow you know, the youth to see them as part of the solution in the future and in, in, in prosperity. So how many ands, keeping in theme with the conference, how many ands have we articulated here this morning? There's a whole lot of yes and, this and. Yes, and, and I, I will say, just kind of to feed off of that too, is, is we also have to support our education system. So. Talk about another and. I mean, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but when you should, we all know the statistics now. Once, once a female gets to sixth grade, for example, their, um, their exposure to anything involving STEAM, STEM, um, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, decreases significantly. When black and brown females, it's even higher. We have to do something to support. I'm not gonna solve our education system. I'm, a, I'm trained as a public school teacher. I loved my job, but I felt like I can even support more and help more by being at the Children's Museum and going out the door and trying to help that way. And it, it's, it's a problem. We have a major problem and we all, everyone in this room needs to try to help and solve that. If I can too, real quick. I know you had another question, but I'm going to add as well. Um, the uh, the idea what what you talked about 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 having people see themselves in, in the opportunity in, in the work. There are studies around animal welfare and veterinary access that say if you live at or below the poverty line, 80 percent of the time you've never had an interaction with a veterinarian in your entire life. And if that's the case, how do you see yourself in that work? So us being able to move into communities that primarily are struggling with with access to services. 
are we inspiring potential the next, the next veterinarian, the next vet tech, the next CEO at Michigan Humane? But then we have that obligation and that opportunity, what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna create economic mobility through a career pathway programs? And, we, and we've been incorporating, I, I, I include that in our mobility programs as well as some of our high school programs, our, our pre-vet programs, our, our, our licensed vet tech programs that we pay for people's education and then hire them as a, as a student, all as opportunities for people to, to see themselves in that, in that career and, and move forward in it with a passion. So a whole different kind of mobility. Whole economic mobility through delivery of mobile services. That's very and interesting. I can, I can actually throw another and on there um, because as you guys are talking about youth education as well, um, there's so many critical pieces that go into that. So we've, we've talked about you know, food insecurity and how do we provide food, how do we provide health care. Those are, those are foundational building blocks if we want children to be able to pursue and show up in, in school and, in, and excel. So I think all of these things come together, right? So as you're talking about those pieces, and Matt, how you highlighted that is, you know, these these are those collaborative pieces where you can bring other other stakeholders together. Um, you know, work that in conversations we're having with DPSCD and in, in the long relationship we've had with the DPSCD Foundation. What are these opportunities? And then other partners that we've talked to. Um, and worked with to figure out, you know, how can we amplify that and make sure that we're bringing those solutions um, to the youth as well, because those are foundational building blocks. So each of the examples that I'm familiar with and that I've touched in the mobile space is a little gritty. It's the kind of work where, you know, you roll up your sleeves, it's not exactly camping, it's not exactly glamping, it's somewhere in the grittier space. And are there people who are not suited to this? Is there a mindset and an attitude that you need to possess to do this kind of service delivery? I, I would hop in and say it's that entrepreneurship piece, right, and the commitment to doing it. Um, you know, I think when we talk about entrepreneurships and even the experience that we've had in, in, in our collaboration, um, making sure that we have the support uh, on the business side for understanding implementation and then executing and achieving is, is really important. So I think that's, that's one aspect, but maybe Matt, your, your point earlier about the fear of the unknown is probably another element of that. Um, and I think it's, it's the advocacy piece that comes back to how can we demonstrate through storytelling and examples of success stories where we're actually seeing a difference and we're seeing impact and we're seeing outcomes in community. And I think the most important part is we do that in partnership with community. What are the needs that we need to solve for? So those are some of the things that come to mind. I would, I would echo what you said and say that, you know, in our industry, we tend to be very emotional over logical sometimes. <clears throat> and, that's, and that's okay as long as you can give emotion direction. Emotion without direction is chaos, but when you give it direction, it becomes something amazing. And what we need it, what people we're looking for to do this work is people who see the community not as a problem to be solved, but as a part of the solution. And that is what we have found through our delivery of services that when we start to engage people, man, they love their pets. They would do anything for their pets over themselves. And I, I don't, matter of fact, I would argue that I don't think we deliver uh, veterinary services. I think we deliver human health care in the form of emotional support, a physical opportunity, um, all of those things. And I, and I think we deliver an essential service, and we need people to recognize that those that we are serving are part of the solution, not a problem to be solved. What's my slogan? For over pharma. There's got to be a better way than just popping a pill. And I think our pets are a piece of that human health continuum. Maggie, you want to add anything? I, I was just going to say, I think that you know, there's a whole slew of, of barriers that um, we, we need to recognize um, and with um, and talking, talking about our little humans right now, that caregivers are up against. They just like people love their animals. People love, of course, their children. We all love our children. But when you're working three jobs, you know sometimes play is not what you're doing when you get home, and in that that has to be acknowledged and it has to be understood that there are ways that we can help support families in a different way and not to go, not to judge, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And uh, I feel that the, the Children's Museums, and again, 
I'm speaking on behalf of all of them across the world, uh, can provide that. Maggie, if the gap between how much I love my children and my dogs is not as big as it is for other people, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Just no. making sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great dogs. <laughs> the good children, great dogs. But even, I know, I, I, I'm with you there. <laughs> I got two kids. <laughs> Take my dog any day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. That's great. <laughs> I love your children. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have some really great questions. So I'm going to, with your permission, jump to these and kind of skip a few of my extras because these are so good. Um, you've all mentioned, we've all talked about bringing services to people, mobility solutions, but are these really scalable? And that is tough, especially when you look at the size of the vehicles we're talking about, they're small. And you can bring small services to a neighborhood, but you're not serving the mass. Is this scalable work? Uh, okay, I'll just pipe in really, really quick. But if you saw the demand that we have for our kids' can van, and we don't charge anything, and don't talk to my finance chair about that right now, but um, it's, it's unbelievable. We cannot get to, we, we say no, like I was sharing all the places we are in just in June. We, I, I promise you we turned down 15 more requests. We can't fill the requests right now if that answers anybody's question. So I, I think absolutely it is. Not only do I, I think it's a necessity for us to move in this direction because I think that we're talking about transportation here, which means that my beautiful facility, which is the, the, the cornerstone of our organization and serves this community so well, is again really good for the people who live around the facility. And it's a, but it, to be sustainable, I have to create a relationship, not just a transaction. And this allows us to be nimble within the community, to respond to communities as they change, uh, and I think meet, meet people in a more meaningful and sustainable way. And through these connections, you know, somebody comes in and adopts a dog, that's great. We go to their home, help them with their pet, connect them to other health and human services, whereas the dog and the family are more stable. I've now solved the problem rather than just put a Band-Aid on it. So I think not only are they sustainable, they're much more powerful. Yeah, I would agree with that too. And on the, the scale, I think it's about being in, intentional about it, right? And so in the planning and the partnerships, um, you know, public, private, philanthropic, like they all play a piece. Those dollars are gonna be needed. And so I couldn't agree with you more, Matt. Like when you think about that, we talked a little about it earlier, you know, the business aspect, how are we thinking about leveraging that expertise from different stakeholders, foundations, private, public, um, you know, how do we bring those together? Because um, we, we owe that to community when we're working in community to have sustainable solutions. And I think that's on us. Uh, in partnership with, with them to figure out how can we ensure that we're making that happen. I would also say to all of us in the room who are in the capacity, we have a capacity to be donors. Um, we can begin having conversations about what do you got in the mobile space? What can we do in the mobile space? If 10 more donors were to put 10 more mobile dental units on the streets of Detroit, we're really talking about some horsepower now. Um, the demand is there. And it's enough, and the overhead is actually so much lower than bricks and mortar yeah. that the, the, the providers will be there if the tools to do this are there. And talk about a great way to, to jumpstart a dental practice when you're just getting out of college with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, put two of these on the road, and you're coming in at about a third of the cost of a bricks and mortar practice. So there's, there's a lot of potential, I would think. But scaling is hard. I mean, we've experienced it. Once you get it out on the road once, it's easy to replicate, though. Then you've got the model. And Joe, you've been terrific at kind of helping us understand, OK, here's what we've learned and the iterative process. Um, great question about we knew we had to address autonomous vehicles. Is, there, uh, is that game changing or not so much in the way that we're delivering it services now? So I, I can start on that You're one. the guy. It was yeah. directed right at you. Thank you. Yeah, prior to being uh, in the Ford Fund, I've been at Ford my entire career, but I spent uh, four and a half years in our self-driving vehicle organization. And so I, I think it's, you know, to me, it's, it's an enabler, right? And so where that technology is today and where it'll be in the future, you know, that's yet to be seen as it develops. But I think we could have that conversation again with AI, we could have that conversation with any emerging technology that we have. And 
um, even the electrification and what we're going through in the auto industry and the transformation that we're going through, there's, there's a certain urgency, I think, that's there. Um, but to me, all of those become very important when they're solving very specific issues. So when we partner with community and we can leverage a technology that can provide access and in, in equity, then I think that's something that we're gonna lean into. And so um, on the autonomous shuttles and, and things that we've done and we've tested in the past, I know those are areas of, in, of development, but at the end of the day, we need to find the right solution set to go with what the needs of the community are. So um, those, are, those are definitely things that have to be considered as we think about mobility. Autonomous vehicles aren't our, aren't our thing because we are such a skill-based organization, but if we can find a way that when you adopt an animal online, it gets delivered in the front seat of a car, it drives itself, I think we're on the way. Or maybe, a, maybe a, a drone. <laughs> That's right. We could put doggies <laughs> on the dog. Mobility is a continuum. That's right. I, I would, I, I, I do have to say probably the number one request when we pull up into a big, huge area where a boatload of kids are, maybe it's um, a Grand Rapids public school, I do have to say the number one thing that the kids want to do is get in the van, you know? And I'm always like, don't let them in the van, <laughs> you know? No, 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 keep them outside and play. I'm always fearful of I don't know what could possibly happen. I am also the person who's like, whoever my colleague is driving, I'm like, put your phone in the glove box. Remember, don't look down at your phone. Don't get distracted while you're driving. Um, but I, I think the exposure to different means of vehicles would be really cool and to share with them how this works and to share with them how you too could help create this moving forward in our future um, would be outstanding. When I was talking to Tim about a project that the city is working on and he was talking about autonomous, I said, but they are occupied, right? So we're not sending vehicles yeah, with no out. humans in them. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's always out. that human factor still, yeah. Yeah. but the, the distractions and the way that the technology is actually better than we are at avoiding accidents and such does give us, I think, some, some hope and promise. Um, Many nonprofits have provided mobile services for years using staff vehicles. I remember doing some of that, um, but it's limited. You can only you know, put three people in a car, right, and transport them somewhere. Um, the ongoing cost is, is a challenge. So any ideas, cars are not getting cheaper. These vehicles are not getting cheaper. Outfitting them with bells and whistles is not getting cheaper. And so while it may be less, it's still a lot. Any thoughts on managing the, the cost aspect of doing this work? I mean, the thing that, that jumps in my mind right away is um, think of idle assets. And I know uh, when we look at nonprofit partners, we specifically, there's, there's expertise that partners have in moving people. If you look at disabled American veterans, they move thousands of veterans to medical appointments every year, and we've had a long-standing relationship to, with them that's done through volunteer. So volunteering, and so you look at um, potentially different layers and stacking those and bringing those together. I think it goes back to that efficiency uh, piece and that shared expertise. So uh, we can't, I, don't, I think it's very difficult to drive that cost down individually, but when we start talking about the power of and and collaboration and what we've talked about today, I think you then have those opportunities to where, where you can really look at what are the synergies that drive down costs and get those dollars back to the people that need them the most? So that, that would be uh, one approach that I think is, is somewhere where we could start. I, I would just add to that, because <clears throat> you're right, the vehicles aren't getting any, any, any cheaper for us either. Our mobile veterinary unit's fantastic, only fits two people, and when you've got a vet, a vet tech, and a social worker, somebody's got to take another vehicle, hence the lightning comes in. But the reality is, um, to your point, the more connections we can make with other organizations that are trying to reach the same people, and oh, you, I'm going to this house, let me deliver this for you. If it's, a, if it's somebody in the Feeding America program and I know that they need their human food and I'm delivering the pet food, well then let's, let's do a two for one here and, and save ourselves some opportunity and create efficiencies. I think there's, a, there's an opportunity for, for, as we deliver these mobile services, for all of these nonprofits to come together and be, a, be more, of a, more of a total one-stop shop for people as they, as they come in to interact with people. And, and I, I want to add, too, that it's very easy for me to say that, well, it's, it's cheaper, actually, for us to go out. It is only, though, if you have partners like Delta Dental, if you have partners like Ford, 
you have to, if you can get that support, especially that initial support, oh my gosh, it is just, I mean, it, it's, it's really a wonderful opportunity. And that's how I think how the world should work. You know, we really do all need to work together to provide these things, but it, it's, it's significantly cheaper for us to go out our doors when you have partners like this. Are you spending time now raising money for mobile solutions? Is that like a sector in your fundraising arena? I am hands down. Matt? And we, we're looking right now, we've really changed our infrastructure significantly the past couple of years. We've you know, uh, closed two of our shelter operations because of the changing just industry that we're in and are looking at re replacing those with much more nimble mobile solutions that are, I think, more effective. So when we first put the mobile units on the street, we did it as a giveaway, and we had very few people apply. We had eight people, as I remember, apply for a giveaway that was, at the time, the costs have come down, but at the time was worth a lot of money. It was like almost $200,000 gift and we had eight dental providers apply. There's a fear, there was a resistance, and even when my community dental centers put the unit on the street, they couldn't get a dentist who wanted to do that. It was like, oh, you're just putting us out in the pasture. It's kind of in the garage is where my chair will be and while the rest of them are in the office in the nice fancy air conditioned you know, bricks and mortar. Right. Um, there is some fear and some resistance. There is a sense, and I've seen it for the last couple of years in dental, there is a sense that it's not as good as coming to the facility, the office, the fancy place with the nice waiting room and things like that. Um, even my colleague, our chief dental officer said, you'll never get affluent people to get in the back of a transit van and get their teeth done. Oh, I think we thought that about Uber once upon a time. It was a ride share for people who couldn't afford their own cars. Now everybody uses Uber. Food trucks, right? We all go to food trucks now. Is there a transition period where it may be serving the streets, but soon enough it will be serving the suites? Is that a time period? for this transition? Is it happening and we're just not talking as much about it on the affluent side of life? I'll answer for our, our perspective. I don't think there's a transition at all because I think our work is so based on the person delivering the service. I'll, g I'll give you a great example of something that we're really proud of is that one of our veterinarians, Dr. Cece, was the shelter veterinarian of the year and she does our mobile unit. So imagine not only having a veterinarian come to your house to help you, but it's the veterinarian of the year in the entire country that we're sending to people's homes in Metro Detroit to help support the, and I think that just is a special feeling for people. And I don't think whether you, whether you are affluent or whether you struggle, um, I think having the, the people who come to your house with the attitude of, I'm here to help you and your pet, it's not about you, it's about your pet. I think we, we haven't struggled with that at all. Yeah, and I, I think that goes back to um, some people that are visionaries in the space that are just doing the work and improving, proving what can be accomplished and what can be achieved by making that happen. Dr. Watson, Dr. Levy. Um, I mean, there's there's many, many, many people in the space, but I, I think to your question, Margaret, over time, it's it's a value exchange, right? And, and meeting people where they're at is, is important. Anything more, Maggie? I, I, you mentioned affluent, and, and those aren't our focal um, spots at all um, where, where we go to. But I would say just one more push as far as, you know, I would say that the overscheduling of kids and uh, the whole, I'm going to schedule you after school, before school, do 400 lesson plans and, and tutoring and all of that is equally as, uh, as damaging uh, to our, our youth. And uh, I think that bringing play to them would be an absolute goal if we could financially um, add that to more free play outside yeah. with dogs. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Um, That's some play. That's some play. The last word, right? Um, thank you so much yeah. for coming. I hope this prompted a lot more questions and that you have more ideas percolating for how we can use mobility to deliver amazing services in our communities. And I just have to give you like a little joke. 
to end with. It's not really a joke, but it's the best thing in the world I've discovered as an excuse for, I didn't ask you if there were any speeding tickets, but if you get a speeding ticket, I found out at the Indy 500 that those drivers going really, really fast actually lose weight when they're driving, like three to five pounds every race. So if you get a speeding ticket, just tell them, I'm trying to lose weight. So yes. Have mobility, right, in there our lives. Go. Have a great day and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Easy peasy. Distinguished.